classes in game design based on the books by George Phillies and Tom Vasil. Design elements of contemporary strategy games and contemporary perspectives in game design, both from third millennium publications, http 3mpub.com slash fillies. And today, this lecture is Lecture 22, Approaches to Good Games, Simulation of Combat. We had a camera fail, so you will miss my comments on Napoleonic and Lord of the Rings cavalry. What I was just explaining when the camera was noted to have gone down was why we do not do a course on design of collectible card games. Namely, it takes too long. You need hugely more time to test collectible card games than you do to test um, normal games. Uh, one way to work around this, and when Money the Gathering first came out, I threw a number of people on the internet into fulminations by explaining it, is the notion that you play this the way you play duplicate bridge. That is, everyone has the same hand. You do not do your own hand design. Or everyone draws ha uh, cards, but everyone has exactly the same choice, so you don't have to go around going broke trying to find uh, the card that they actually only printed 13 of, uh, the card that causes automatic victory for your side. Um, however, the net result is that it is fairly challenging to playtest these things, and you can get into trouble very easily. Okay, so what are you trying to do if you playtest? You have one more playtest session, so I will urge you to keep this in mind. Number one, the objective of playtesting is not to win. The objective of playtesting is to see if the game works or not. And to a significant extent, what you are trying to do is break the game while adhering to the rules. For example, discovering there is some combination of moves that gives one side or the other the victory for entirely meritless reasons. Or you make a move that technically works, um, but was not what the designers have thought of. There is a wonderful Steve Jackson cartoon. It is a space liner, except for the interesting parts blown out in the middle. And what is obviously the pilot is saying to, what do you mean you stopped the spaceship hijackers by throwing an antimatter hand grenade at them? And this is the sort of thing that no sensible person would, of course, do, you would hope, in the real world. But if the players do it, it can happen. I see no one knows the historical issue of the foreign airline, they put combat troops on board each airliner, in which, well, they were Russian hand grenades, but they threw three or four of them at the hijackers, and 747s are so well built that they are landable afterwards. At least if you have an airline that adheres to American training standards. Okay, what else are you looking for? Rules that are loose, rules that are unclear, um, dominant strategies. Uh, if you look at my discussion, the article by me, he who dies with the most games wins, you will find my comment on the one computer game I do play, though very rarely, Space Empires, uh, which has the unfortunate limitation that there's something of a dominant strategy. One of the weapon systems really is a lot better than the others under most conditions. Oh yes, other suggestions. Variety of playtesters. If you always playtest with the same people, you will see the same categories of strategy being used even though it's a new game of yours, it's another new game of yours, it's a third new game of yours. Uh, the equivalent in, um, is if you are writing and you have the one critic who will always discuss number and amount, the other critic who will always check spelling and nothing else. Uh, the critic who views plot consistency as a disadvantage of small minds, and therefore is not at all upset if the lead character 
not in a science fiction novel, changes gender and species repeatedly as the, as the novel wears on. Um, well, you want variety. You also want people who are doing, we're going to put this into effect, the net final play test session is out of the box. You get to play it. Hopefully you will be able to play it as homework before you show up here to play it so you can discover interesting things like, aren't there supposed to be unit counters in here? Um, but um, in any event, it will be a different group of people play testing each time. That's very important because it means you're getting a fresh point of view each time. Um, and a final thought on playtesting, one that many companies ignore. Playtesting is like proofreading. You are actually done playtesting if there are no mistakes caught in a, in a proofreading pass. If you catch any mistakes, you aren't done yet. Now, under modern conditions, it's a lot easier than when I was an undergraduate using a typewriter, namely your computers, will do spell checking for you. Some of them can even spell. Some of them can even impose grammar rules, which other people have ever heard of before. Well, some of them do, some of them don't. If you have to make a lot of changes, it's not the final pass yet. Oh, yes. Frank Nestel, Frank and Doris Games. Um, he is a bit more of a designer. She is, in fact, an artist who is also a designer. Um, and he discusses, well, the question, so what do you come up with first, a theme or a mechanic? The advantage of coming up with a theme, if it's any good, is that it tunes your mind towards reading through the mechanics and finding things. On the other hand, he talks about his game, Ursupa, Primordial Soup. And it's about monocellular organisms in the primitive world, roughly speaking. And these things sit here, and they absorb sunlight or eat other things or whatever. And they dump into their environment other organic molecules that other things eat. A modern example would be a farm field where, in the American South, you plant peanuts. The peanuts are kind enough to pull nitrogen out of the air, and you refresh your farm field simply by growing peanuts. It works. It works very well. Well, in any event, this game about microorganisms is actually risk in disguise. Now, the key issue, the redesign, which makes it a very different game, is that in risk, there are no logistics issues. If you want to pile up 2,000 armies, this would be a fairly large number by most standards. If you want to pile up 2,000 armies in Kamchatka, which is the far easternmost part of Russia, <coughs> Uh, an area full of volcanoes, ice, snowstorm, a uh, number of predators like snow leopards, A, they think you're food, B, they can jump about 20 feet vertically, so climbing a tree just helps them find you. Um, well, if you don't mind B, that issue, it's fine, but in fact, logistics are important, and so he has a set of rules where, in essence, um, one set of, an all of these sets of animals are doing things, but they're also dropping food. For example, they're plants and they drop seeds, whatever, uh, for other species to eat. And you have to keep on the move or unfortunate things happen. It's risk in disguise, but it's a very different game because of these extra pieces. The other thing that comes in, I've warned you about exponential takeoff. The reason you have exponential takeoff in games is that there are typically no resource limitations, there are no overpopulation problems, there are nothing, nothing, there's nothing that gets in the way of an exponential. 
The counterexample to that, a counterexample, is the Roman Emperor Justinian. Justinian was a very sharp fellow. He had several sharp, very good generals, such as Narses, who no one has ever heard of, and Belisarius, who large numbers of people have heard of. And he was on his way to completely rebuilding the Roman Empire. That is, Byzantium was on its march towards it had reconquered northern Europe, it had almost finished reconquered Italy, and there would be very little in its path in the long run from reconquering the rest of the Roman Empire, and then Rome would have risen. Except as he was doing this, his cities were getting bigger, and one fine day, the Black Death, or one of the other unpleasant plagues, there's some question about which one, because the symptoms don't match quite any current modern disease, um, got loose, and where there were ten villages, now there was one and it was somewhat underpopulated. In some cities, eight or nine out of ten people died. Uh, this sounds very medieval. There are a number of people who are firmly convinced that if uh, the SARS, the sudden acute respiratory syndrome thing had gotten loose. You could have seen it right around you because it was about a 60% mortality rate that spread, spread just like the flu. Um, well, in any event, suddenly Justinian ran into a limitation on exponential growth. Um, you can, uh, there are other sorts of limitations if your economics rules are sufficiently good. For example, if you do nothing but build steel mills and concrete mills and cities, eventually you run into the embarrassing wall that you are building cities and when you're done they're empty because there's no one to live in them. Or um, we can name a foreign, I will abstain from naming the foreign country that has actually pulled this stunt. Uh, or you are using the civil engineering schemes for bribery, this is a different foreign country, and you are to the point where almost all of your rivers have been paved. They're very, it's very nice that they're paved. There are no washouts, there are no embarrassing difficulties. You do see little concrete walls along the banks, but it's, it's, absurd. it's completely runaway and absurd. Okay, so, what else do we get out of this fellow? Well, he gives advice about trying to get into the game industry. Now, the advice he gives on giving to the game industry is focused more on the board at game industry, so there are some details which you have to tune a bit. For example, there, in board gaming, there's significantly more opportunity for you to you do the design you attempt to sell it to someone and there is a significant likelihood that they might actually want it. <coughs> so what suggestions does he make? Well, number one, rejection should not be viewed as a personal issue, it's a commercial issue. Number two, the community really isn't that big. It may look big, but it isn't. And if you get a reputation as being the north end of a southbound horse, um, other people will be happy to find reasons to do other things than to hire you or look at your designs, you know, to retain their sanity points. Um, you want to maintain a contact log, and his recommendation on this, which is actually fairly sound, is that you actually want a contact notebook, loose leaf so you can keep it alphabetical, on the grounds that if you have something that you can leaf through, it's much easier to put lots of notes and details on paper and to search paper than it is to search really large, non-well-structured files. I mean, it's fine to search a um, database if, for example, you're looking for something that happened in the year 1830 and there is this nice database column that says 1830. But if you're trying to find something that is not necessarily going to be easily searchable, paper has great advantages. You also want to know your targets if you're dealing with people and, you know, there are computer games that do massive blood and gore. There are computer, ga there are computer game companies that do nothing but sports and racing games. 
There are computer <coughs> game companies that are really targeting 9 to 12 year old girls. Uh, these are usually separate companies or separate divisions. Know who you are trying to reach. And if you do send something off like a resume, especially if it's been invited, at the time you're speaking to the people and say you'll send it to them, number one, be sure you send it immediately. And number two, when you say, yes, I'll send it to you, oh, when do you want me to contact you if you have any questions? And be sure you don't lose that little datum. As you do things, keep notes on what you did so you know who you sent what. Uh, there, he, little gives one suggestion which is not the same as uh, some other people give, but it sounds reasonable to me. If you are going to send something off, make sure you are sending your best possible work, not something that if it's art, make sure it doesn't look like I drew it. Is this clear enough? Make sure it does not look like I drew it. Make sure it looks like someone competent drew it. Um, on going along with that draw on whatever you're doing, if you really like this, even if you have a day job that's something else, you will keep doing it spontaneously. And you should keep in mind the observation of Mozart and Picasso, which was, yes, one is a musician, one is an artist. They both did fantastic work, and they both had something in common. Not only did they do fantastic work, they did huge amounts of um, fantastic work. Uh, the quotation from Mozart is not quite fit for mixed company, but involves pigs. Uh, but the notion is simply he wrote notes and he could, as fast as he could write, he could hear the music. If he had been lucky enough to have a modern pen, there would be far more Mozart music out there. Bach was the same way. Uh, the other comment on that from Picasso, he was in one of the um, Paris salons and the woman regretted I do not have a one of the other famous artists of the period. And Picasso said, oh, that's no problem. And you have a corner and a pen. And of course she did. And 30 minutes later, up went whoever it was. And several days later, the fellow came in and he looked. That's me, but I never drew that. And the great great artists could all imitate each other. It was a dolly, and Dolly had, of course, had the appropriate sense of humor to appreciate this, um, and they could imitate each other. There is nothing wrong with imitation and borrowing as long as it's not plagiarism. And cleverly copying ideas from other people is an important part of being creative. Okay. So I have said a fair amount about playtesting and about getting better games. And if my notes would turn over. Oh yes, a few more thoughts. Fixing simple games is much harder than fixing challenging games. If you are designing a medieval combat game and you already have all 43 of Gary Gygax's variety of pole arms in there, you may have to, to I meant 43 too, he was very fond of them. Um, you may want to say, well, we need a few extra varieties of these giant can openers on sticks, which is what a pole arm is, and um, that won't change the game too much. On the other hand, if you have only one melee weapon um, and you either decide let's not have melee weapons or you add two of them, life becomes much more complicated because the continuum of interactions has now turned into something very discreet. Uh, sharp distance between board game rules and computer game rules 
the expectation in board games is you know the rules and they're precise. There are many computer game gamers who are happy to explore and try to figure out what the rules are, and they have absolutely no complaint when the instruction to escape from this room because it's on fire is verily defenestrate thyself. And the fact that there are no other magic words that are more than six letters or commands of other than two words, it's exploration. Uh, board gamers tend to get extremely annoyed and do things like throwing the computer across the room. Okay, let's see. Martin Wallace, um, who is actually has a real job, he designs games as a hobby. He then goes off to Essen. Essen is a city in Germany. Um, uh, he takes 500 or 1,000 copies of his game with him. These are shipping issues that you have to solve, but he's in England where it's a little easier. And he sells the games, and this pays for the trip, and it pays for all of the stuff he's shipping back. Um, but he's not inter looking for big business. It's a completely different philosophy, but he's still designing and is very well respected. He does, however, mention an extremely amusing game balance stratagem. <clears throat> and the amusing game balance stratagem, the game is called Byzantium, and it is the period uh, after the Islamites are marching north. And it is a competition between the Byzantines and the Islamites, the Arabs, as to who will compete successfully. And he has a very clever scheme for balancing this. Namely, each player moves some of the Byzantine armies and some of the Arab armies. And you are trying to win, except you have to keep the two scores balanced. That is, you cannot arrange to give, say, your Byzantine player huge numbers of points by having your Arab armies simply get out of the way so your Byzantine armies collapse. If you do that, you will not be in good shape. So you actually are playing both sides, and you have to balance things. A World War II version of this, this is an actual game. So here's World War II in Europe. And here are the German fascists. And here are the Russians attacking them. This is 1944. And here are the Americans and British, mostly the Americans, attacking them the other way. And the question is, how do you make this an interesting game, given that the outcome is certain? And the answer is, one player takes the Russians and the German army facing the Americans. And the other player takes the Americans and the German army facing the Russians. And there is now a question of, well, who loses more terrain or whatever. And you, you have to figure out how you balance. But both sides are, both the players are playing against each other, but they're not identified with a single side. We have something that arranges competitivity. Okay. Jason Little, another game designer. Jason Little does sports games. And as I commented early on, the disadvantage of doing sports games, this is, well, the camera was off, alas, over doing, say, games on placating the gods of the ancient Babylonians, is that most people in this room would be hard pressed to name more than one or three Babylonian gods. Um, how many of you can name any hands? Okay, there's a hand up, good. Uh, however, if you wanted the fine details of red or white goat and which day, hour of the day, most of you would be really hard pressed. And by the way, it's not on the internet. They didn't have it back then. Um, on the other hand, if you were designing a baseball game, people get really, really picky about the exact rules. And you had better, if you're going to implement something that's real and exact, you had better do it right. 
uh, correspondingly, um, if you are implementing a game with really obscure rules like golf, you had better research it very, very carefully. Tennis can be that way. Almost any game has some really obscure rules. And there will be the people who will buy your game are the ones who are most likely to know what those rules are and observe that you have not implemented them. <coughs> uh, this is not to say that you cannot get away with butchering things, and some people will say you did a good job. Uh, some years ago, there was a Hollywood movie about a presidential election. You may have heard we're having one of these. Uh, and <clears throat> this third party, which no one has ever heard of here, enters the race, and the candidate of the alleged third party wins the election by getting 175 electoral votes, which, by the way, is not a majority. And if this happens in the real world, he does not win. The election goes to the House of Representatives, one vote per state. Well, the Hollywood people decided they didn't expect their American audience to know anything about the Constitution, like issues that are usually taught in about seventh grade, and they produced it anyhow. <clears throat> this is no worse than the, um, I'll change the name slightly. <clears throat> the movie was originally called Tunisia West of Libya, excuse me, Tunisia East of Libya, until someone pointed out after the film was out there for a few days, but Tunisia is, by the way, west of Libya, and they very rapidly retitled the movie. <clears throat> yeah, you can do things like this, but it doesn't give you a good name. Okay, so let us return to simulating combat. And people who know exceedingly little about combat <coughs> and simulating it We'll say, well, we have units of side A here, and they're shooting at units of side B there, and we can calculate how fast each side takes losses, and that's all we need to do. And this very seriously misses what's going on in most types of combat. And what you instead do is, to, Charles Roberts' great innovation was to say, we can assign numerical strengths to units, and we will, for example, take a ratio of attacker strength to defender strength, and that gives us some indication of what's going to happen. However, in terms of a combat results table, something that gives us odds, relative strengths this way, and die rolls and results that way, there are lots of cute things you can do to make things more interesting for the players. To a certain extent, for a lot of these, you don't, these don't even have to be right completely, especially if it's on a large unit scale, but you add things like this and it appears to add richness to the tactics. So what can you do? Well, you can say that under certain conditions, I'm attacking here, the other side is defending there, the other side is so impolite as to hide behind a large river, or to hide in mountains or whatever. And because he has done so, his defensive strength is increased, and so you modify the defensive strength for the terrain. Now, some modifications have additional effects. I mean, there are plenty of people who say, oh, mountains, good, we'll defend in them. You should, however, realize that when mountains inhibit enemy movement, they also inhibit yours. And if you notice you are losing and wish to head to the rear, the fact that you are in a mountain range is very unpleasant. And tends to, or if your backs are to the river, this is another traditional one. <clears throat> You're sitting here, defending, and the other guy attacks across the river. Or if even worse, defends here with a couple of bridges behind him. And if you charge through, 
this is several, any of several Napoleonic battles, and get at the bridges, he has no way to retreat. His troops may be able to swim the river, they'll probably lose their muskets. Uh, the horses will be willing to swim the river if the weather isn't too bad. Cannon, I have some bad news for you. A three ton mass of bronze does not swim, does not float, and cannot be carried on the shoulders of men. It's gone. It's a very expensive error. Another alternative, this is either a Napoleonic or a modern, is to say combined arms. The general notion of combined arms is that if you set up a formation, a large formation that is all A or all B or all C, it is weaker in general than a formation that has different sorts of weapons represented. Under modern conditions, the classic example is we have a unit that's full of tanks, big things on treads with guns, and no associated infantry. And what happens is you roll into some place with cover, you roll into a town, and especially up until quite recently, your tank was basically um, a coffin to which treads had incidentally been attached. People start shooting at you, and if you close the hatch, they can't hit you. But you can't see anything, like the fellow walking up behind you to um, plant the magnetic mine under your engine compartment. Um, the Russians had, a, World War II had a cute variation of this. It's sort of like Caesar's flaming pigs. They had dogs that were trained to run under tanks. However, when they sent them to run under the German tanks, they'd attached a fair amount of high explosive and something that would trigger the high explosive to the dog. The dog would run under the tank and suddenly the tank would blow up. Well, if you have infantry along, they notice the dog coming at them, the dog with the funny things on its back, and they start shooting. This is cruel to the dog, but you know, you could have used prisoners, political prisoners too. Uh, that would be cruel also. Uh, in any event, um, <clears throat> combined arms, the traditional, the modern version is armored vehicles, infantry, artillery, air support. The version from 200 years ago, Napoleonic, is cavalry, cannon, infantry, and the combinations became very interesting. Um, so how does this feed into the combat results table? Well, I may have 30 combat factors in my attacking force, but it may be that if G, I have some of each type of weapon present, you have several choices. They're columns. I outnumber the enemy 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 5 to 1, and it may be that if I have combined arms, I get a column shift of one or two columns. On the other hand, another alternative, yeah, the die roll goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, but I can also apply DRM, die roll modifiers, so I roll dice to see what happens, and then I add or subtract a number from it. And because I add or subtract the numbers, I get into results up here or results down there, and I may not like the results or I may as much or I may like them more. Um, a limitation on this, we're almost out of time, is granularity. Um, there is a certain temptation from some designers to say, well, if we put a certain amount of detail in, it's good. If we put in more detail, it's better. And I am reminded of this unfortunate, it was some more or less modern battle. And there were tank forces advancing. And there were helicopters, and like many modern helicopters, they were carrying at least one air-to-air -air missile to shoot at the enemy helicopter. This doesn't work too well, but it can. And so you sat there for several turns while the 
nearly supersonic missile marched across the game board over several turns to see if it hit the enemy helicopter or not. Now let's think of this. We are watching something cross a game board at possibly supersonic speed and it takes several turns. My guy on foot, if this were uh, 40 years ago, it could have been me, with 70 pounds on my back and an M16 and a gas mask and helmet and boots and hand, goes on for a while, don't think, I don't, we could go on for a while, you get the idea. I am walking. Uh, if it's good terrain, I might be running. If it takes the supersonic missile several turns to get to my opponent, how many turns does it take me? Hint. Lots. More than you would conceivably want to play. And the notion is, and this should have been picked up in playtesting, namely, uh, you, the infantry can never move enough to ever reach its opposition, even to get into gunfire range. You just sort of watch the missile and watch the missile, and this can go on for quite some time. Okay, that's combat variations. My closing thought, well, the first quote is from logi on logistics, it's from Napoleon. An army marches on its stomach. An army that loses supply does very badly. A modern army that loses supply does even worse. These modern tanks with their wonderful turbine engines are going through fuel all the time. And if your logistics train gets messed up, you have serious difficulties. The other point is morale. Um, some of you may recall, actually you're sort of old enough to remember 9-11. And uh, there were the people who flew the airliners into buildings. And there were people who went into rants about how cowardly they were. And someone did make, and got very other, lots of people very annoyed at him when he said, well, you know, if that's their cowards, what are their brave people going to be doing? And someone else dug up, this goes back to the start of World War II, it's actually not true. The American pilot who sp spotted the battle, Japanese battleship Haruna and flew his airplane straight down the smokestack, thus wrecking the engines. This is actually not what he did. He did get a Congressional Medal of Honor for something else. And you have to realize that there's some people who are very brave, and there are other people like the first Iraq war, the Iraqi army battalion, this is about a thousand men, and they realize that this jeep full of CNN photographers has driven up to them unarmed. And the CNN photographers realize there are a thousand armed Iraqis all around us. And the Iraqis realize, we can surrender! And they surrender. This is bad morale as opposed to good morale. It's very important. And it's somewhat difficult to simulate. I see that we are out of time. I have gone on about game design and combat simulation a bit. And we are done.